Freedom Planet. While it's not a perfect game series, it is truly a gem of indie game industry, which sadly doesn't receive the recognition it deserves. Despite their colorful and vivid facade, these games are not afraid to cover dark topics and show us the wildest of villains. And they have a decent selection of bad guys, from thieves and traitors to intergalactic warlords and water dragon centurions. However, what if I told you there's one villain that manages to get away with their crimes? Someone whose evil deeds are ignored even though they may be quite significant on global scale. Greetings everybody, I'm your host Lunatic Ludwig and today we'll find out how Mayor Zhao of Shenmue is a secret villain of planet Avalis. First of all, let's take a look at what we already know about our Red Panda. Mayor Zhao is the leader of the Kingdom of Shenmue, a position that he manages to keep for years at this point thanks to his charisma. He also has a huge ego which sometimes gets the better of him. So let me get this straight. The Magister says that if we join together and fight Mr. Braben, we get half of the Kingdom's stone's energy. Sounds like a fair offer, does it not? Are you kidding? My city needs way more than half! <laughs> You just want to hog the last of our reserves. I know you feel a little jealous, but I can't help if my city is bigger than yours. Ugh. Hold on a minute, fellas! Zhao also appears to be responsible for major part of entertainment on Avalis, with huge malls, amusement parks and battle arenas. All in all, the mayor has quite a lot of influence on the entire planet, and with such great power, of course, comes great responsibility. So, he must maintain an image of an appropriate leader, right? Well, throughout the games I've noticed some moments that may hint Zhao might be hiding a darker side. Let's start with the obvious, the Mall and Zhao Land. Those places are not safe even in the slightest. Unless you're the game's protagonist, getting seriously injured or even dying here will be just a matter of time. No safety railings or safety equipment and aggressive robots are all over the place. You may say that these robots are Bravens or Murgis and Waiters, but if Zhao truly was a responsible mayor, he would not let this happen on his property. This fact alone would already cause Zhao a hell ton of problems, but his responsibility doesn't end here. Now we have the Battle Sphere. Let's take a quick look at the disclaimer shown at the very end of the Battle Sphere commercial, because it has enough questionable information to raise eyebrows. Must be 13 years or older to apply. A quick Google search showed me that minors, those are usually people under 18 years, must not be involved in activities that could lead to injuries, let alone death. And the next statement implies that there are possibilities of such outcomes, because something alike must have taken place in the past. Man, it gets darker the more I think about it. The Battle Sphere is not responsible for death, dismemberment, injuries or hair loss of any kind. This one is a bit tricky. On the one hand, this statement makes sense when death, an injury or what have you is caused by some other Battle Sphere competitor. For example, if Captain Kalao were to brawl with Carol the Wildcat and in a fine broke her leg, he would be responsible for his opponent's injury, even if it was an accident. However, such battles are more of an exception to the usual challenges of the Battle Sphere, at least from what we see in the game. The vast majority of the Battle Sphere challenges are battle against robots made especially for that purpose, for injuring those who dared participating. Not only that, but spikes, flamethrowers and many more exceptionally dangerous hazards are present in these challenges. I mean, how many Soul Goodmans and Phoenix Rides you need to pay to dodge every single liability that would come from the Battle Sphere alone? Oh, and you seemingly can demand a refund for entering the arena regardless of how dire of a situation you got yourself in. And the cherry on top gotta be the prizes. Just imagine going through the literal hell of the Battle Sphere challenges, getting burned, impaled and every single bone in your body cracked just to receive a free dinner coupon. Yeah, I can relate to Carol's disappointment here. Sure, those came in handy for the heroes later in the game, but in regular circumstances, a prize like this is not worth the effort you have to put into fighting. Then there are the time capsules, which, of course, good thing that Lalek and friends get to obtain them, but unless you're a historian, this would be practically worthless. That just shows how greedy Mayor Zell is and how indifferent he is to all the chaos that is happening to regular people around him. Nevertheless, this is something other characters don't consider morally wrong or even arrogant on Zell's part. 
After all, some NPC claims that none other than General Gong got his position in Shang Tujin army because the Magister witnessed his Battlesphere performance. But there are also some moments that I find quite suspicious. Let's have a look at one of the Battlesphere's many challenges, namely Battlebot Revenge. Its description says, plow through all of the Battlesphere's unique enemies and bosses in one sitting. And they are the enemies that you will face in this challenge, but here's a catch. These two robots will appear later in the game, in Globe Opera 2 and Tidal Gate to be specific. By the way, while trying to find out if any of the Battlesphere's robots were used in the stages you can access before entering the arena, I found out that Battlesphere challenges use the same fire-throwing enemies as Airship Siguada and much later in the game Clockwork or Boredom. Now, you don't find it a little bit strange that Zao reuses the robots from previous stages and some quote-unquote unique Battlesphere enemies reappear on later levels? But here's something much more sinister. Most of those unique enemies release a tick upon the fit. According to Kukri, an NPC from Adventure Square Hub, ticks are the dark spirits that control the robots, and ticks are also released after defeating the robots that obey none other than Murga. Now you may say, Ludwig, ticks could just possess Zao's robots during Murga's invasion, let alone Murga herself could take control over the robots, hence why they appear in later levels. And that's a fair point, but here's my counter-argument. This enemy is called Helpo, and to my knowledge it doesn't appear anywhere else outside of the Battlesphere. However, they also release a tick upon defeat, and yet they, along the mayor himself, are directly involved in delivering the grand prize at the end of the Battlesphere episode with seemingly no ill intent. The fact that the player can't really learn about the ticks until they reach Perusa suggests that these spirits are native to Perusa, and Murga, having the islands as her center of operation, figured out a good use for them. But how in the world Zhao, out of all people, was able to take control of her ticks? We know Zhao traveled to Perusa at least once in order to recruit Captain Kalao as a Battlesphere champion. But for some reason, when you're traveling to Perusa by Zhao's airship, he doesn't want to get too close. You may automatically assume he's just afraid of Murga or her followers, but no. Later he provides Team Lilac with aerial transportation to the volcano, and then he also picks the girls up and begins a chase after Bakunawa. Reason must be something else. For starters, why didn't Murga just kill the mayor when she took him hostage, if, as she states, he's just a miserable speck of a man? Because she needs Zhao for something, and killing him now is invaluable to her. Murga shows clear signs of a psychopath, so her keeping Zhao alive isn't out of any good intent, but rather for personal gain. So what if Zhao and Murga are working together? Zhao provides Murga with his robots, and Murga in return spares Zhao's life and doesn't invade Shenmu. If Murga saw Shenmu as a threat, she would have made sure nobody prepares a counterattack from here. With that said, why does Siguata shoot down Zhao's airship when approaching the volcano? Well, a deal between Zhao and Murga didn't involve her followers, thus Corazon still thinks that Zhao is a threat, or at least a nuisance that needs to be disposed of. But then, why does Zhao help the heroes in stopping Murga's plans and even goes as far as chasing down Bakunawa with cannons, albeit it ends up in failure? Well, he might have given Team Lilac a false hope. After all, why would they stop to fight Krabulum when they had a perfect opportunity to catch up to Bakunawa? But what's more likely, Zao agreed to help for personal gain as well. The only reason he took Team Lilac to Perusa is because he wanted to recruit a new Battlesphere champion, and gets annoyed whenever he has to pick up the girls. Yet he still does it just to charge them with a fee when it's all over. What else would you expect from someone who is more concerned about making an apology video rather than the one and only moon of Avalis being destroyed? Pause. There's one argument against my theory that I remembered only when I began editing this video. So, after abandoning still tied up mayor in the auditorium, Tim Lilac plus Gong and the Magister went to the city hall of Shenmue to find shelter in Zhao's domain. And he, regardless of what happened recently, still lets them in and, though unintentionally, agrees to help them further. Not something I'd expect from Mayor's childish behavior, but I can explain this. Perhaps Zhao let the heroes in because it was his another scheme to earn more money, and this coupon Steam Lilac won worth nothing. He later proceeds to brag about his library and airship, but then he regrets it because it will make him put himself in danger later, and he may not earn any money from that.
Different villains in a single story do not have to pursue the same goal. And while Murga wants to take revenge on Earth Dragons and Serpentine wants to reunite with his master Lord Brevan, Merzau just wants to keep his wealth and reputation. And while there's nothing particularly wrong with that, Zhao has some, should I say, shady means of achieving his goal. He even allied with Brevan in the first game, or more like brainwashed Prince Dale, as his involvement played a major role in stealing the Kingdom Stone. The alliance was short-lived, however, as Brevan turned his back on Zhao once his role was played. This is Ludwig from the future speaking, and I'd like to retract my previous statement about Zhao allying with Brevan, because this is not the case. Listen what Zao has to say when he loses the Kingdom Stone. It's gone! My one chance for re-election is gone! Later we learn that Zao took the Kingdom Stone just to solve the energy crisis Shenmue was facing overnight. That, however, doesn't deny the fact that Zao committed a serious crime by putting a source of energy of the three kingdoms in grave danger. And later he refuses to team up with Shen Tu in order to contribute to retrieving the Kingdom Stone back. Until he was told of benefits he gets from that, of course. In the end, Zhao is just a greedy businessman who values himself and his personal gains above anything else. What I personally find creepy about this villain archetype is how realistic it actually is. You don't have to kill someone to be evil, it's your regard towards others that says enough. And there's a lot of people like Maya Zhao in our world, except they may be far worse. But after all. It's just a theory, a game theory that is, and it doesn't have to be correct. If you enjoyed this video, consider leaving a like and subscribe on this channel. This has been Lunatic Ludwig, until the next time.